Hi, folks. I should probably move away from being mic'd in two separate places. It is good to welcome all of you here this afternoon. Some of you I've met before, and uh, we're also streaming this afternoon, so just so everybody knows that. And my name is Steve, and I happen to be one of the ministers. I keep saying I happen to be one of the ministers here. It's been a couple of years since there's been anybody else here with me, but uh, it's, it's, it's my pleasure on behalf of St. Paul's to welcome you this afternoon, but also to welcome you um, on behalf of Citizens for Peace. This afternoon, we have the privilege of hearing from Bill Chambra, who uh, this morning was at a service at Central United Church and was speaking about his experience in Palestine and Israel as an ecumenical accompanier. Ecumenical accompanier simply means uh, ecumenical is a Greek word talking about all churches. And for many years, uh, the World Council of Churches has had uh, human rights observers, ecumenical accompaniers in Palestine in about six different locations most of the time. And it's an international body. When I was there in 2013, I had the privilege of working with um, two people from Ireland, a German, and a Finn. My biggest concern with all of that was that three of them were vegetarians and the other one was a vegan. That was a serious issue for me. Um, I was in Bethlehem. And so, I know that not all of you are Christians. We have this, we have this space mainly because it's, it's an easy space to access. We're familiar with the technology that exists here. And we're very fortunate that um, St. Paul's is a congregation that sees itself as being open. And by open, I mean welcoming of all people, no matter what background, but also welcoming in terms of engaging in difficult questions about issues. Bill is here with us this afternoon. Bill lives in Halifax. He's originally, you're originally from Fredericton, aren't you? I grew up there. I was born in Montreal, grew up in Fredericton, University of no. Alberta. We'll forgive, you, we'll forgive you of your connections to Alberta. <laughs> I also lived there for, for a few years. Uh, but in all seriousness, Bill spent much of his career in the, in the military as, uh, and has been from coast to coast to coast in this country. And a few years ago, he decided that when he grew up, after hearing, some, <coughs> excuse me, after hearing somebody speak about the ecumenical accompaniment program, that that was something that he wanted to take on. And Bill has had uh, two trips to Palestine, uh, one in the South Hebron Hills, and he'll describe these in far more detail, but also one in East Jerusalem, and that was this past summer. And he, like many of us, is able to stay in contact with some of the people there, even after having been away for more than a decade for me. Um, I'm still in close touch with some of the people there. Bill's wife, Andrea, is not with us this afternoon. I think th she's still serving in the military, and I think she's at a Christmas dinner someplace. And uh, Bill is an engineer by training, but uh, he also has two adult sons, and one of them lives with them in Halifax as he's wrapping up an engineering degree. And so, Bill, welcome. It's, it's a pleasure to see you again. And thank you for, for coming and for sharing some of your story with us. Okay, thank you. One last, oh. one, last, one last thing I'm going to mention. There are some Mounties who are here, just as there are at all of the events that have taken place around uh, Palestine and Israel. I have welcomed them in, and they are welcome to come in. It's not that there's anything that's going on that's a problem or trouble or that they want to intimidate anybody in any way, shape, or form. They just, as they said to me, it's better to have us here rather than to, it's better to see us rather than to need us. <laughs> and so we appreciate their presence. They may wander in. Two other things. For one, um, I should have said the washrooms. If you go out either door and follow the main corridor, 
you'll see them sort of on the right hand side down a very small corridor. And after the, uh, after the event this afternoon, you're welcome to join us for some refreshments, just very light refreshments, but uh, you're welcome to join us for that. And Bill, over to you. I'm going to duck out for a minute because I, I need to get something out of my office. Okay, well, thanks Steve for the introduction. So, if there are any burning issues, uh, we're gonna have a question and answer session afterwards. And in order to make sure everything's recorded, what I'll do is I will repeat your question so anyone following on Facebook will, can also pick it up. So if you've got a burning issue, if I say something you really didn't understand, you can ask a question during, but probably best to wait until the end for the, for the Q&A session. So as Steve mentioned, I was with the Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel. World Council of Churches started this about 20 years ago in response to requests from people in the area who were concerned about the level of violence and wanting to get international monitors there. The idea that people behave a little better when there's internationals watching. Typically, 25 to 30 accompaniers come in at a time for three month intervals and they're sent off to different locations. Uh, they have come from 20 to 25 different countries. There's been 2000 or so. It's been a continuous presence over the years except during COVID and presently right now after, after the conflict on October 7th, within about three or four days, they were all sent home to their home countries. But we're there to promote peace and justice through nonviolence and protective presence. Human rights monitoring is, is a big part of what we do. Just the idea that if we're standing there in our vests, people know who we are, and often people will behave a little better. A couple of the key dates, and I, there's a much longer version of this slide, but I thought I'd just boil it down to a couple of the key dates with the Balfour Declaration of 1917 that uh, Arthur Balfour declared that Palestine would be the future home of the Jewish people, eventual creation of the State of Israel or the Nakba in 1948, the catastrophe, the Six Days War in 1967 changed the face of Israel-Palestine and we don't know what it's gonna look like at the end of 2023 uh, if this is NACPA 2.0. To give you an idea of the size of the area we're talking about, the West Bank and Prince Edward Island are almost exactly the same size. A five square kilometer difference in size between the two of them and the similarities end there. Prince Edward Island with 157,000 people the West Bank with 3 million, plus about 700,000 now uh, illegal Israeli settlers. And what you see on the West Bank with the different colors, areas A and B are the lighter colored. So there's some semblance of Palestinian authority control there. Area C is full Israeli administrative and military control, that's the darker color. So you can see even within the Palestinian controlled areas, you're going from island to island. And I'll be telling the story of, of someone who got in trouble with that because you need different permits to go to different parts. And, uh, and it can be, make life a little more difficult for people there. And Gaza, so this is some bank, Banksy art uh, that's in the Waldorf Hotel. I'll touch a bit on Gaza just to give a little more background. We didn't get to go to Gaza. You need a different kind of permit, different visa to go in there. We couldn't do that. So we were strictly uh, West Bank and East Jerusalem. But if you look at the Gaza Strip, again, for size comparison, draw a straight line from Moncton to Baktouche. That's about 43 kilometers. You make that line eight and a half kilometers wide put a wall around it and put the population of the four Atlantic provinces in there. And that's 
Gaza and restrict what goes in and out. So incredible population density. So when they talk about Hamas using human shields and, and, and so forth, well, pretty darn hard to get out in the open and fight if you were inclined to, that wherever you go, there's going to be a lot of people around. Uh, very, very densely populated. Another way of looking at it, the city of St. John has a land area that's 87 or 88% the size of the Gaza Strip, except St. John has about 70,000 people rather than two and a half million. So that gives you an idea of, the, of what, what they're looking at there. The areas where we were active when I was there, Jericho, so that was up and down the Jordan Valley. We had two teams in Jerusalem, uh, Bethlehem, Hebron, and at the bottom, Yatta, the South Hebron Hills. So the first year I was there, I was in, uh, in Yatta and the South Hebron Hills area. And I'll do a bit of a, a recap of uh, my 2022 experience in Yatta. So the yellow cross-hatched area down on the bottom is Masafar Yatta. Uh, and you can see in the center, the city of Yatta, uh, one of the big issues that we dealt with when I was there or that was going on was the Israeli Supreme Court cleared the way to clear out Masafar Yatta. They had, 20 years ago, Israel had said this is going to be military firing zone 918 and that the people living there would have to leave. And the Palestinians fought that in the courts for 20 years and figuring they had international law on their side because this is forced displacement of people in an occupied territory. And ultimately the Supreme Court said, our laws override international laws. Uh, the military, you are cleared, clean out the Palestinian population. So people there are still hanging on. I'm getting regular reports about uh, homes being demolished and vehicles being confiscated and settlers attacking communities, <coughs> but they're, they're hanging on. The people who were involved in the court case that went to the Supreme Court, they got, they each have to pay 20,000 shekels, so about seven or $8,000 for having taken it to the Supreme Court. So, you know, in addition to losing everything, in addition to going against international law, um, they also had to pay a, a monetary fine for just taking it to court. There are a number of communities up there. Uh, Susia is an area that I went to a lot. That's on the left side in the red, pink area. Um, and things have really picked up in terms of settler violence against the people. A number of other communities I'm hearing from in Atawani and other areas where settler violence is really picking up with the soldiers having been mostly sent to Gaza. What they're left with are settler soldiers, the settlers that take off, dust off their old uniforms and they're showing up with weapons and destroying homes, destroying the contents of homes, uh, intimidating people, and to some degree it's working. Some people have just said, you know, I've had enough. This isn't worth it anymore. It's not worth uh, risking my family's life any longer. This was an example of a protest I went to last year where the Palestinians showed up with their prayer mats under their arms and at the at midday-ish, they did their dzur prayer, the midday prayer, um, and Israeli counter-protesters showed up with their M16s trying to intimidate, trying to keep us from going in there and making comments like, I'd like to kill every last one of you. Um, in the end, the soldiers showed up and they fired tear gas to clear out the peaceful Palestinian protesters and the observers, the settlers were allowed to stay. Uh, but they cleared us out and the Palestinians did come to us afterwards 
to say, thank you for being there. If you weren't there, we'd have been arrested, we'd have been beaten, or worse. And it was the, the idea of the international presence, the monitors, did make a difference. So that's the whole protective presence thing that I'm mentioning. How do outpost settlements get started? So this is from Haaretz uh, on the 8th of July. A farmer goes out to, his, to check on his flock. He sees a tent set up by his well. He calls his four sons who go over and there are settlers saying, this is our land now. They tried to take down the tent. They were beaten. They called the police and the military who eventually showed up and they arrested the four Palestinians on their own land. Um, and an outpost is born. Outposts are illegal under Israeli and international law, but they tend, they have a way of becoming settlements after a while. And even if this family was to get the courts to rule in their favor, doesn't matter, nobody's gonna enforce it. The military won't go against the settlers. Um, and I'll touch on that a little bit more when we get to uh, uh, breaking the silence. But a new, a new outpost created on Palestinian land. This was another example of protective presence, the shepherd there, Hajjabreen. Um, four Israeli teens, youth, came down to scatter his sheep and to throw rocks. And uh, we're not supposed to intervene directly we don't touch anybody, we don't get involved, but I made a point of, well, I stood two meters behind to at least show I've got your back. And it didn't get any worse from there. Uh, some nasty words were exchanged and rocks were thrown, nobody got hurt, but you could just see the contempt, the hatred in the eyes of those uh, Israeli youth that, that came out and uh, Anyway, we're, we're glad, and Hai Shabrin and his wife, they're wonderful people. Uh, they've raised eight children. One of them's a doctor, I think living in Venezuela now, and of course he can't come back. And another one of his sons that I met just graduated from engineering school. So they've, you know, very nice family, bright family, and he's been getting regular death threats that I assume have escalated since October 7th. I don't know if he's still there. I don't know how long they can hang on. And that's, uh, that's him. So this year I was in Jerusalem, uh, East Jerusalem, and the old city. And to give an idea of um, the geography, so down towards the lower center part, you can see the old city. Um, and up at the top, it's a little off the screen, but uh, Sheikh Jarrah, and I've also, you can see where I've, I've marked the Western Wall and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and um, Silwan, and so there's a couple of areas that I'm gonna touch on, um, places that we went to. So we went to home demolitions, which it's gotta be the worst thing to do, to go to, to, to attend, uh, evictions, checkpoints, um, people coming in for work, doing school runs, watching kids go to school, uh, general protective presence and liaising with other, other groups. One of the demolitions we went to in Silwan, it was um, two structures on the property uh, nine families, it was seven brothers and their families, and one of the brothers, his oldest child, had started his own family, and mother was there. So altogether, nine families, 80 people, 30 of them under the age of 18. The problem there was permits. If you're Palis you need a permit to build anything, and if you're Palestinian, permits are, will almost always be denied. Um, they had been through lawyers, they had an architect design, um, they went through lawyers and always reject. And after a while, it gets a little bit like Charlie Brown trying to kick the football, they're always gonna move it. Um, 
So the demolition notice came, they had their lawyer go to court to confirm it's just the new house, just the illegal one, and the judge said, yes, it's just the new house that has to come down. Uh, when the bulldozers arrived, he said, nope, everything's coming down. Uh, so they had just moved everything, everything from the new house to the original house, and now suddenly you've got about five minutes to get everything out of the main house, the original house. Um, when we arrived, it was all done. Um, when the government demolishes, they charge 100,000 shekels, so the equivalent of about 36, 37,000 Canadian dollars to have your place demolished. A lot of that is for security. Um, and still they showed us hospitality. The Palestinian way is to show hospitality. So when we arrived, well, they couldn't make coffee or tea. They had somebody run out to the corner store and get us a couple of ice cream sandwiches and a two liter bottle of water because you can't receive people without showing them hospitality. Um, and I really, honestly, you didn't have to show hospitality that day, but they, it, it's, it's what they do. This was another demolition. Uh, in East Jerusalem. This one was a self-demolition, or what they call self-demolition, it's a coerced demolition. So it's the small structure on the right. Um, it was son and his, his uh, pregnant wife, um, and it was essentially a little two-bedroom, a modest two-bedroom apartment. It had to be demolished, you didn't have a permit. Uh, they're going to demolish it themselves to save the 100,000 shekels, but so difficult for the, uh, the father of the family to, after all that effort of putting, putting it together, that they have to take it down. And they also figured, better to do it ourselves because if the demolition team comes, they're gonna take out the olive trees and everything else that's in the way. So at least we can limit the damage to the illegal structure. So that's the demolition beginning by hand, and they were hoping the kitchen, you can see brand new appliances, they were hoping that that was going to be able to stay, um, and I did not get an answer uh, before I left. It was a decision to follow. This was another interesting demolition, and it wasn't that they built a new structure, there had always been a structure there. What they did was they renovated and made it nice. And the authorities said, you didn't have permit to build that. Well, it was always there. All we did was fix it up and make it nice. Well, it's gotta come down. Uh, you didn't have a permit. And this is what it looked like when we went and we were told that's not good enough, all the walls have to come down to. Uh, when we were talking to him, he was expressing optimism that he thought in six to 12 months, he hoped to get a permit to rebuild. And I asked our driver on the way back, is there, is there any reason for his optimism? Is, is this really going to happen? And he said, no, he'll never get a permit to rebuild. The last demolition I'm going talk to talk about at this time, a 65-year-old widow in Wadi al Jaz, just outside of old Jerusalem. So it was between where we lived and the old city about halfway, and uh, she had gone for a medical appointment, and when she came back, soldiers closed off either end of the street, the demolition equipment was already there, and that was it. Uh, she couldn't get back into her house to get anything. Uh, I called a couple of my teammates who were still at the house, and we were coming in from Old Jerusalem, and we got there roughly the same time, uh, the soldiers closed off the road and said, you can't go there. And we said, well, we know somebody there. Can we go? No, no, you can't because the road's closed. Well, why? Because the road's closed. Uh, so we took the attitude, well, the road's closed, but the olive orchard looks to be open. So we went through the olive orchard and got to her that way. And one of the people on our team, she's from Sweden, but her family's from Iraq. So she spoke pretty good Arabic, she wear, wears a hijab, 
and she was able to hug and comfort the woman in a way that we couldn't and got the information that I passed on to the office so they could get in touch with her about different support services she could contact. And then the soldiers noticed that we had gotten around and came down and were screaming at us and, uh, you have no respect for the law. And uh, I said, well, you told us the road was closed, so we didn't use the road, we used the, and he didn't seem to like that. But uh, my colleague was a little upset that they were screaming and, uh, you know, during my 34 years in the military, I've had a few people scream at me before, so it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't that big an adjustment for me. Evictions. Uh, one eviction I'm going to focus on, the Sublaban family. They were in the Muslim quarter of Old Jerusalem. Nura Sublaban, uh, she's 72 years old. She had lived there all her life. Uh, she was a protected resident uh, under an agreement since Jordanian rule. However, Israel has a law that if Palestinians are out of their home for a certain period of time, they can't go back. Their home is going to be given to um, settlers. And the neighbors had set up a camera across the street. She was in the hospital with fused discs, and she couldn't climb the stairs for a couple of months. And a uh, neighbor set up a camera to show that she wasn't there for a couple of months. Only her husband was, and he's not a protected resident. Only she is. And eventually, after fighting it in the courts, the judge said, yep, you don't live there anymore. Because of your temporary medical absence, you don't live there anymore. You have to go. And uh, for, a long, for a, about a month, we, had, uh, we were stopping in every, every morning. We'd go there early in the morning for a few hours, and then we'd go to our other places. The other four people in the picture on the right-hand side are young people from an Israeli group called Free Jerusalem. So these are young Jewish Israelis who come out and stand up for Palestinian rights. And in fact, the one that's right next to my colleague, uh, second from the right, I actually met him a year earlier in the South Hebron Hills, uh, he was attacked by a settler, got clubbed in the side of the head, taken to hospital, and he just keeps going. And uh, so they had some peaceful protests. The apartment in question is the upstairs with the metal grid over the windows. Downstairs used to be where they had their store, but that was taken from them by the Israeli government. Uh, so there were a few peaceful protests. Uh, generally, they didn't have the Palestinian flag flying because that just stirs the ire of, of the Israeli settlers. What their son did when he was making signs was he would paint pictures of watermelons on them, which is sort of the de facto symbol for the Palestinian flag. It's got the, the red, the white, the green, the black, and people have actually been arrested for carrying pictures of watermelons, but, and then soon released because they realize how stupid that looks. But we'd have the protests, the counter-protests. They were insisted that this is gonna remain peaceful. Um, so on the right-hand side, the, the woman with the gray hair is a Jewish Israeli who's debating rather fiercely with a, uh, some of the settler youth who are counter-protesting. And actually what, on the eighth of, about a month after they could initially be evicted, eighth uh, of July, we, um, I read in Haaretz that six o'clock in the morning, 20 armed officers stormed the house to remove uh, Mustafa Sublaban, her husband, uh, Nora had been in hospital the night before, so they removed her husband and the six peaceful protesters. Uh, when Nora got out of the hospital, she wasn't allowed back in. She couldn't pick up her prescription meds or the chicken casserole that her daughter gave her the day before. That's it. It all belongs to settlers now. You can't get back. And uh, so a lot of 
her hospital time, you gotta think that when people don't know from one day to the next, am I gonna lose my home tomorrow? There's health issues, hypertension, diabetes, a lot of health issues that is sort of an untold problem of, of, uh, of the occupation and some of the health issues she was suffering from that had her out of the house when they were, uh, when the soldiers came to remove them. So we also went to checkpoints, checkpoint 300 and Kalandia on opposite ends of Jerusalem. I usually went to checkpoint 300, which is close to Bethlehem, and we'd go at different times of day. I'd be monitoring, I'd be keeping track of roughly how many people were going in. I'd be doing sample surveys of, okay, I'm going to count how many people go by in the next five minutes, and I'll do that now and then. And that's the engineer in me that, that likes numbers, and uh, it wasn't part of, uh, part of the job. And then we'd, we'd, uh, we'd talk to some of the people who were rejected and try to find out why. And sometimes, wrong permit, permit expired. We had a list in Arabic of, you know, here are the common reasons, is it one of those? And often, we made good use of Google Translate on our phones, um, which helped for communicating. Some of the people could speak English, um, but we, we, we got to be known there. There was a taxi driver who'd be bringing us Arabic coffee uh, every day. Uh, we, we, we'd certainly get to know and chat with some of the people. There was one gentleman we saw who had um, a disabled adult son in a wheelchair who was quadriplegic and nonverbal. Uh, and they have a humanitarian gate for people like that, but it wasn't open. Uh, my colleague got on the phone and she was calling different numbers and just getting people screaming at her saying, leave me alone, stop, we're not going. I went through and I spoke to one of the soldiers. I explained the situation and he said, thank you very much for telling me. I'll get someone out there right away. Given the way I was going, he probably thought I was on my way to Jerusalem and I wouldn't know the difference. Instead, I made a left turn and went back to Bethlehem only to find nobody's coming. So this poor man uh, took his adult son, holding him vertically, going through the turnstiles, going through these sort of turnstiles and getting him through, and somebody else collapsed the wheelchair and managed to get the wheelchair through. And there were a couple of such turnstiles, three, three checkpoints to get through, uh, and he eventually made it. We were watching, we were going back and forth during our shift, and by the end of our shift, he had just made it through. Um, you know, they, they may talk about this being security. It's, that's got nothing to do with security. This, this is just, trying to make life as miserable as possible for Palestinians. We, uh, on the lighter side, uh, we, we had, there were a couple of young men who were talking with us and joking around and, and it might have looked like we were, they were causing problems for us if you were watching from a distance. And this little school girl who was maybe 10 or 12 years old in her school uniform, she had walked by and then she came back and she said, do you need help? And, and I said, no, we're, we're fine, really, thank you. She said, no, I think you need help. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what she would have done to help us if we did, but I, I, I went to her and I thanked her very much for looking out for us, that I thought that was very kind of her and very thoughtful, uh, but really these guys are just joking and, and uh, and we, we, we don't need help, these are friendly people. Uh, we're all on the same side. But uh, I, I thought that was, that was really a, a special moment at the checkpoint. <coughs> school runs. Going to school during exam week. If you're a Palestinian teenage boy, you could count on getting special treatment for soldier, from soldiers. Getting pulled aside, tossed up against the wall, uh, body frisking, lift your shirt, um, check your bag, check your ID, 
wait around for 10, 15 minutes while they get a response to see that you're okay. But this was regular treatment for Palestinian teenage boys on their way to school in, in Old Jerusalem. Um, the one on the left, uh, he in particular, he, he went through the whole treatment and then after about 10, 15 minutes, he said, can I have my ID back? And the soldiers hissed at him and one, you can see the hand up by his throat, grabbed him by the throat, but they hissed at him. They didn't answer. And there was a bit of a scuffle. And after a couple of minutes, he went on his way to school and we caught up with him. We spoke with him. One of the shopkeepers was our translator. So we got his name and age and statistics to pass on to UNICEF. But he said, oops, sorry. He said what really upset him the most was not so much being stopped or even having a hand on his throat, but the fact that they hissed at him in response, that they treated him like he was an animal. They denied him his humanity. And, and to him, that was the most upsetting aspect of this. In the picture on the right, uh, one of my colleagues took that and she was told, a soldier came to her and said, in the interest of child protection, you need permission before you can take photos, which seemed, really? <laughs> so, so the child didn't speak English. Uh, she went up to him and she pointed to his, her vest and she pulled out her phone and she said, thumbs up, thumbs down. And he gave her two thumbs up. And after the ordeal was done, he gave a thank you, thank you, thank you uh, when it was done. That they really did appreciate us being there, uh, that they were less likely to get beaten up or, or harassed as badly when we were there. And, and it made a difference. Protective presence. And here's a photo that uh, <laughs> I know, Steve, you were among the first. <laughs> to see this on Flag Day, which commemorates the anniversary of Israel taking Old Jerusalem. And uh, there are a lot of people, people with Israeli flags coming in and some of the things they're shouting according to the news papers that I read were death to Arabs, burn your villages. It can get kind of ugly there. They don't want people watching that. So on this occasion, uh, my colleague Sophie and I were just doing our regular protective presence walk and security pulled us aside to check our IDs and to check our bags and uh, told us we had to leave the city. Why? Because it's a very special day, you can't be here. And I said, I know it's flag day, but that doesn't start for another six hours. We don't know when it's gonna start. It could start anytime, you have to leave the city. So a photojournalist from Haaretz happened to be walking by while we were pulled aside and he snapped this picture and he sent it out to his followers and it got retweeted and resent and within minutes we were getting phone calls from our office saying, are you guys okay? And later in the day, other NGOs in Jerusalem were calling us to make sure we're okay. And in less than 24 hours, some activists in our area had received uh, a copy of this and Steve was one of them. And uh, in less than 24 hours, somebody sent that to my wife to say, hey, isn't that Bill? And <laughs> I had already told her about it at that point and said, yep, that's him. We knew, knew about that one. So why don't they want us in the old city? Here was a young Palestinian who was that's maybe about three meters away from where we were standing. And again, if you look closely, you can see the hatred and the contempt in the eyes of the people that are beating them up. And this is in the Muslim quarter of the old city. But they just, you keep people, uh, if you're not Jewish Israeli, that's a day that you try to stay out. And this was, from a distance, we could see hundreds, thousands of people streaming into the city with their flags. The next day, a lot of them were still around. We were allowed into the old city. A lot of them were still around. Things settled down a bit. 
They did try to storm the Al-Aqsa Mosque at one point, and Israeli security kept them back and fired off some tear gas. And we took refuge in a church from the tear gas. So we do liaison with other NGOs. Um, when children were being searched on their way to school, we'd let UNICEF know. Uh, Norwegian Refugee Council, they'd be people that would know when, with home demolitions. So there'd be different people that we would keep informed uh, with different reports. But we would try to keep our, uh, we'd try to keep people notified as to, uh, to what was going on. And we had a lot of, uh, like I say, a lot of different, uh, different groups that were involved. So we visited communities at risk. Uh, Silwan, which is just outside of the old city, and it's an area that is predominantly uh, Palestinian, and Israel is gradually wanting to turn that into Jewish-Israeli. Um, a lot of homes are being demolished to make way for King David Archaeological Park, and some homes people are being evicted, and then settler families move in. So uh, we would be there regularly. The murals on the walls, you'll, you'll see the eyes figure prominently uh, in a lot of the paintings on the walls. And there are eyes to show that you're being watched. And the eyes are all eyes of individual people, that the eyes of George Floyd are there, and, and eyes of other people who, uh, who have died over the years. But the eyes, the eyes are watching. And we... We would go there Tuesday afternoons. We'd make our presence known, but we'd go Tuesday afternoons. We'd go up that staircase and we'd uh, just play with the children. It was sort of a bit of a light afternoon where um, we'd be pushing them on the swings or uh, the older ones would be teaching my colleagues how to, how to dance some Palestinian dances. And I think they knew better than to try to teach me, but my, my uh, colleagues, they, they worked on them. So we, we went to a number of other areas, the Shufat refugee camp in uh, Jerusalem, You'd get there on the bus, no problem getting in, coming out was a bit of an issue. Uh, you'd have to pass through checkpoints coming out. Usually as a Westerner, a foreigner, we're used to not having problems, but coming out of Shufat, they wanted to know, what were you doing in there? Uh, well, we didn't want to tell them who, they, who we were talking to, because that might make problems. So oh, we're just tourists. We were just going in to look around. Why? There's nothing to see. Don't you know how dangerous it is? No, it's not dangerous if you're not going in to knock down their homes or take their children, but we didn't. that was what we said to ourselves. Um, and we had people say the same thing to, in Silwan. Um, I never go into Silwan without eight armed guards around me. Uh, yeah, well... <laughs> That's not really a problem for us. So we went to a number of other places. Uh, Khan al-Akbar, where, uh, where the leader in the community, when I came, he said, Canada, your country is bad. You support Israel. But you are welcome. And, uh, and I did, anyone who was watching how we vote at the UN, it was not the first time I was told Canada, what are you doing here? Um, and I could only say, well, I'm going to try to take your stories back home. Navi Samuel, that was always women's groups that were uh, meeting there. And it was mostly women that I was with. So that would be my turn to stay home and cook. And the women would go out to Navi Samuel and talk with the women. And one of the stories one of them told was she said her, hus her son was going across a field and a soldier yelled out to him, to, uh, wait, I've got to check your ID. And they checked his ID and they checked him over and everything was fine. And then the soldier got angry with him. You made me run all this way for nothing. And uh, he said, I want you to carry me back on your back. Give me a piggyback back. And supposedly, according to these women, he took the soldier in full combat gear on his back and he walked him back to his post. I would have, anywhere else in the world, I'd say, you've got to be kidding me. This didn't really happen, did it? But here, yeah, 
Maybe, but maybe not. Anyway, they, they took it rather as a w very amusing. I mean, with all the other things they go through, that is just a little bit of um, amusement, comparatively speaking. So that's Silwan during poppy season. So that's walking from Old Jerusalem to Silwan. We'd go out, show solidarity with other groups. West Jerusalem, women in black, uh, Jewish Israeli women who protest against the occupation every Friday afternoon, one o'clock, and we're just there to watch. Uh, we don't participate in protests. We, we watch, we observe, we take notes if they're having any issues. Uh, Sheikh Jarrah every Friday at five o'clock, and I mentioned Navi Samuel. So Sheikh Jarrah weekly protest, standard, you've got Palestinians and their sympathizers on the left, uh, Israeli counter-protesters on the right, the army in between, keep the two sides apart. And one thing I want to draw your attention to, at the lower left, you can sort of see the cat that I also have in the center. Every Friday, that cat was there and was always on the Palestinian side of the road. But uh, probably thought better treats, better treatment on the Palestinian side. Uh, the picture on the right, the gentleman with the big flag, Abu Hamas, he's a, a leader in the community, and he uh, is fearless. He's been shot, he's been imprisoned, he's been beaten, and he will never give up. And uh, usually the soldiers would try to say, don't go this way, go that way, so we can keep the sides apart. And his attitude was, this is Palestine, I'm going to go wherever I want. I think his words were a little more colorful than that. But, um, and so the soldiers would surround him and make sure that the sides stayed apart. So I actually had a little respect for the military there, that they actually did a good job of letting people have their say and keeping them safe, keeping the two sides apart. One thing that wasn't directly connected with my work uh, our internet service was down. Internet service technician came by. He was short on tools. He had a small plastic bag with a few tools. Uh, he had come on public transit because his car was seized the previous week. Um, he and his pregnant wife were fo forced out of their car. And when I was earlier, I was showing the little islands in the West Bank, and it was an issue of wanting to get to his wife's family place but they didn't have the right permit to go from one island to another. So they don't just turn you back, they take your car. And it took six weeks to get the car back. It was eventually returned. It was, you had the army saying, uh, the police have it. The police say the army has it. His lawyer was going to court to argue. On one occasion, he went out to pick up his car from the army and the guy that he was supposed to see was on holidays, come back next week. Eventually, he got his car back. Uh, I kept in touch with them, and their daughter, Mary, was born on the 5th of September and is doing fine. I have contacted him since October 7th, and he's obviously, he said his immediate family is okay. His concern is for his brothers and sisters elsewhere in Palestine and his anger with the hypocrisy of the West and the support, the undying support that some can countries are giving Israel. Uh, and he really fears for the future that Mary is gonna have. We went to military court watch. Uh, that was set up in 1967 under the Geneva Convention as an occupying force, much like what the Allies did in Germany and Japan at the end of the Second World War although that same Geneva Convention also prohibits uh, construction of settlements. Um, 500 to 1,000 children per year are uh, being detained, some as young as 12, typically done in night raids, middle of the night, grab the child, blindfold them, zip tie their hands behind their back, no legal counsel, and uh, eventual coercion until they confess and prison time for 
a 12-year-old that might have thrown a rock. 99% um, conviction rate, essentially, if you are accused, you're pretty well guilty unless you can prove solid proof you were somewhere else at the time. But conviction rate is almost 100%. And um, most 50 to 70% of the children get moved across borders, at least across from Palestine to Israel, which is also a war crime, and that's what Vladimir Putin is uh, being charged with, actually. We watched a proceeding <coughs> where there were no children at the proceedings we watched. Uh, I think they were early 20s. Somebody was accused of throwing a rock. Someone else was accused of being in the vicinity of someone who had a Molotov cocktail. Um, judges do tend to be more lenient when they know there's international monitors watching. Breaking the silence. The young woman in, in the center is a former soldier. She said she was a settler. She grew up as a settler. Um, she didn't know she was a settler. All she was told is, this is Israel, and those people over there are Arabs who want to hurt you. Stay away from them. She didn't know anything about the occupation until she went to college and people started telling her about it and she started doing a little more research. And uh, one of the things she explained to us when it comes to soldiers in the West Bank at the settlements, uh, why we couldn't count on them for support if settlers were being violent, she said that when soldiers aren't very well paid, they're not very well fed, they go to a settlement, the settlers will invite them in. You want a nice hot home cooked meal? You want a warm shower? Come on in. By the way, you work for us now. Don't ever cross us. And it was pretty obvious that this, the soldiers worked for the settlers. And typically, if there was an issue, we'd have to call the police as well. The, the police would at least show up. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily do anything, but they'd at least show up. Uh, and sometimes take a report if it was, unless it was a Palestinian involved, in which they, case they wouldn't show up. They'd just say, go to the police station. But um, certainly it, it, her talk with us uh, solidified the overall, yeah, this is, this is what it's like. This is what you're up against when you're dealing with, uh, with soldiers. And there were various threats uh, to NGOs, monitors, um, threats to Iapi volunteers. Like I said, I was, I was removed from Old Jerusalem on three different occasions. Uh, and by the time I finished there, we weren't allowed into Old Jerusalem at all, at least not wearing our vests. And the next group that came in after me, likewise, they couldn't wear their vests, which you want people to know who you are and who they can go to. So what they wound up doing was they went to the school and they would have their principal introduce them to the children to say, you know, here are some of the people that are watching. These are people you can go to. But uh, they, they certainly uh, tried to make difficult, life difficult for us to be, uh, to be monitoring. And certainly the... Uh, Presently, some of the laws that have been passed since October 7th, we were talking to uh, one of our colleagues in Jerusalem who said that under the consumption of terrorist publication, you can now get prison time for something that you looked at on Facebook or on Twitter or X or whatever, that you might just be scrolling through and you don't know what it is, that peaceful protests are illegal. So his comment was, they're counting on us to be their voice because they don't have a voice. I'm going to talk one more demolition I'm going to mention. This was in Wadi Kadum in Silwan. Um, we went out the day before the demolition, and a young lady named Dunya, maybe 19 years old, she spoke perfect English. Uh, she took us around the house. It was two structures. Um, housing five families and she was telling us a bit about who lived in each in each home um, and there was a younger 
sibling or cousin that was following us, and she was watching my face as we went around. And as we got to the end, she said, don't worry. Does this. You're about to lose your home, and you're concerned about how it's impacting me. Um, the next day, we came back for the actual demolition, and this was a, a self-demolition, uh, or a coerced demolition, because they didn't want to pay for the soldiers to keep people out. Um, and again, Dunya was with us, and her comment to us was, you're both from wealthy countries, that in this case, Sweden and Canada. She said, you could be anywhere in the world right now, but you're here with us. And she wanted us to know how much that meant to them. And I guess when, you know, are we having any impact? Does it make a difference? At least feeling that they have people from outside who are in solidarity with them made a huge difference to her. And her comment was, the only thing I ask of you is that when you go home, tell them, tell them what it's like for us living under occupation. So maintaining our spirits, we had this wonderful little home in East Jerusalem. Mother cat had kittens maybe a month or so before we arrived. And they, they were all feral. We couldn't actually touch them. The closest they'd get would be maybe sniff our hands while we're giving them treats. But uh, every day, regardless of what was going on, my wife could count on receiving a photo from me of, oh, look, they're all in the flower pot today or, or whatever, that, that uh, it just get, kept this little semblance of normalcy of, of humanity in our lives, that if you're coming back from a tough day. And we also happen to have a very good team. Um, and it's mostly young people who are early in their careers. They've just finished university. They don't have... Uh, mortgages or families yet, or you got old people like me whose, whose children are a little older and we finished paying for our houses. So as it worked out, it was me and five women from Europe, all under 30. Uh, they were like the daughters I never had. Um, so we had two from Sweden, uh, two from Denmark, one from the Netherlands, and uh, we got along great. There was no dietary issues. There was one who was a pescatarian, uh, only ate fish, but not meat, other meat, and another who didn't like fish. But, you know, whatever we were doing, if I was cooking, okay, here's the vegetarian version, here's the meat version. Uh, it's not a big deal. If I'm making makluba, here's vegetarian makluba, here's chicken makluba, no big deal. We always, we got along well, and it made a huge difference at the end of the day to, uh, just talk about what, what went on uh, the day during the day. So meanwhile, in Canada, what's Canada doing? I think Canadians, and this was before October 7th, a survey done by ECOs for uh, Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East, a plurality said Israel is a state with apartheid and another 20% with restricted minority rights, only 11% see it as a vibrant democracy. But yet, a year ago, the UN voted 87 to 26, asking for the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion on the illegality of the occupation and eventual annexation. Canada was one of 26 countries that voted against that. And in August, we took it a step further asking the International Court to drop their advisory opinion. Uh, and the best I could hear, I heard Bob Ray interviewed on that, and he said, essentially, it's because Israel doesn't want it. Um, anyway, it's... Uh, another... The cost, the human cost of conflict, and this is before October 7th, this is covering 2008 to 2020, that typically a 22 to one ratio of deaths of Palestinians to Israelis. So it's far from being an even playing field. Uh, when I made this presentation to uh, the Maritime Muslim Academy in Halifax, and one boy asked, why do you think Palestinians are more willing to die for their cause than Israelis? 
That, that actually wasn't the takeaway I was looking for. <laughs> that that if, if a missile hits your apartment building and a couple of hundred people are killed, it doesn't mean you're more willing to die. It's just the, the uh, big disparity in military power on the two sides. So what next and where to go from here? Um, ceasefire, humanitarian aid. Uh, I had about a one hour chat with my member of parliament and I've been sending him other stuff since. Uh, when I get daily, when I get my updates, I'll occasionally send him a little package to say, this is what's happened just in the last 24 hours in one small part of the South Hebron Hills. Um, and just keep pushing the politicians for advocating for ceasefire. That I've, some of the votes at the UN that have happened over the last, uh, in the last few weeks, the votes typically go 165 to seven, with the seven being Canada, US, Israel, Hungary, and, and maybe a couple of Pacific Island countries. Uh, we're, we're against the grain. Uh, it's, it's a different Canada than the one that stood up against apartheid in the 1980s against South Africa. Uh, and I guess I, I think in moving towards a just peace to encourage our politicians that human rights, standing up for human rights and adherence to international law for both sides. And yet I fully condemn the actions uh, that happened on October 7th involving a lot of innocent civilians, but at the same time international law, uh, I think of Masafariyata, the illegal settlements, the detention of children, and other war crimes that are happening on a daily basis, and we turn a blind eye to it. Um, <clears throat> As a starting point, what I was telling them at one point, come up with a definition of anti-Semitism that doesn't conflate criticism of Israel with actual anti-Semitism. And maybe come up with a clear definition of apartheid. You've got two separate laws, sets of laws applying to two different people in the same area. To me, that's apartheid. Um, and of course, what's going on now, depending on what definitions you use is this genocide now uh, it, it certainly has the makings of a genocide and we should not be on the wrong side of history on any genocide um, something you might want to check out on Netflix born in Gaza if you haven't seen that and this was made after the 2014 war but a lot of the places they name and a lot of the, what they're talking about, it's, it's the same now. And what kids, what it's like for children growing up in post-war Gaza. And at this point, uh, thank you for hanging in there with me. Um, I'd like to open the, the floor for questions. And uh, like I say, when you ask a question, I will try to, I'll repeat it back so the people who are following online can also hear. Oh, and you've got a microphone. So, so. You can unmute me too. Okay, I am unmuted. Um, thank you, Bill. I do have a microphone in terms of anybody who wants to ask any questions. Um, a couple of things I would, I would add in terms of that were different in terms of my experience. One of the realities that I came to understand when I was there was that Israel has an unlimited budget for, um, for tear gas. <laughs> Every time I turned around, it seemed like I was getting tear gas. I got tear gas someplace around 15 or more times while I was there in my three months. And so what you learn to do in a case like that, anybody know how to deal with tear gas? You bring along an onion and you smash the onion and it brings tears to your eyes because tear gas actually dries your eyes out. So I always had an onion on me after a while. 
Um, one of the things Bill didn't mention is the old city of Jerusalem. It's a walled city, and it's absolutely beautiful and spectacular. It's, uh, it's, it's a real privilege to have been there. And the one other thing I would mention is Bill was talking about being a protective presence. When I was in Bethlehem, we used to go to a little village called Tuku. And the kids who were there were elementary school kids. And, of course, English wasn't their first language. But they were taking English courses. And so they would run up to us and they would... <clears throat> it was always the same question. What's your name? Where are you from? How long are you here for? I don't know if they understood a word that we said in response. And one of the guys who I knew eventually got really... Uh, he was a Brit, and he was, he was a little bit cynical about things. He would tell everybody that he was Tiger Woods. <laughs> so we'll open it up to questions. Just please put up your hand, and I'll run the microphone out to you. Yes, yeah, certainly when you, when you mention about the tear gas, and there's a refugee camp in Bethlehem where... I we, we, Yeah. Yeah. And one of the uh, people we met was doing a study on birth defects and a disproportionate number of birth defects because you can't go a week without getting tear gas. And pregnant women getting, there's not a, a fixed scientific link, but another one of the costs of the occupation is that you've got pregnant women inhaling tear gas and causing birth defects. Um, Hi, thank you so much for the uh, the presentation. Uh, I think it's really uh, important to have somebody who has firsthand experience to to you know come and uh, share all of this uh, with us, and it should be happening way more. Um, what do you see as the possible outcome with in, t in terms of a political solution? Um, I know recently the Palestinian Authority, President Mahmoud Abbas came out and he basically stated that U.S. complicity um, in what Israel is doing now, um, you know, makes them uh, very responsible. Yeah. And I know the U.S. has, their, their stated goal was to have the Palestinian Authority basically take over in, in Gaza and, uh, and other areas of, uh, of Palestine. So do you see a possibility for... Um, any type of political solution with the parties that are there? And, and what role do you see as Canada uh, being able to play? Good, good question. So um, Canada's official position is that we support a two-state solution. It's on our website, two-state two solution, global affairs says, and we oppose any actions that would be an impediment to a two-state solution. So I will often make reference to that in my correspondence with members of parliament. Uh, ultimately, I, don't, I wish I knew what the answer was. Uh, two-state solution when you've got 700,000 Israelis living in the West Bank, which is, hey, is the size of Prince Edward Island, and those people, it's going to be pretty hard to get them out. I mean, you've... In the past, Israel has removed settlements from the Sinai and from Gaza, uh, but getting those people out of the West Bank, so how do you deal with that? Will it be a one-state solution where everybody has equal rights? Uh, that would be nice, but then is Israel going to allow that? Because if they ever become a minority, it's no longer a Jewish state. Uh, so it's going to be, it looks internationally like pushing for the idea of two states side by side. Uh, don't know what you'd do with the settlements. Um, I'm actually listening on this trip, I'm listening to a book called The Hundred Years War Against, Ga against uh, Palestine. And right now I'm at the section where they're talking about various Palestinian leaders who've been assassinated by Mossad and, and others. And that's certainly been a problem, too, that a lot of the, if a, a leader gets credible, then Israel is going to 
look after removing them. Uh, so getting credible leadership in place is also going to be a challenge. Um, I don't see how Hamas can, how they can be at the table. And again, I don't know how they can't be. Um, and Mahmoud Abbas, um, the Palestinian Authority, at least from the folks I talked to in the, the West Bank, they don't have a lot of time for the Palestinian Authority either. They see them as being corrupt and, and, uh, and complicit uh, with a lot of what Israel's doing. So not an easy solution and not an easy solution in getting who's that other side you're gonna talk to in moving ahead for Palestinians. I mean, I'm hoping that we can see possibly a two-state solution or some kind of a just peace, but I think it's gonna take an international effort to, um, to actually create the conditions for, for that just peace. And, uh, and can Canada play an honest broker kind of role? And at the moment, at least from the folks I spoke to, were seen as being America Junior. That um, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if there's a role that we can reasonably uh, be expected to play. But uh, yeah, and it, it's a long way of saying I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Um, no, I guess my follow-up question would be, what do you see as the most important thing politically to happen inside Canada that uh, would need to happen uh, for us to be that honest broker and for us to kind of get back to what we say we, uh, you know, what we say we believe in and, and the values, quote-unquote values, that we, we try and espouse? I know that's a big question, obviously. Yeah. But that is something that obviously needs to happen. It's, it's great to see so many people here but I think uh, we would love to see more. And so how do we get to that? I, I would like to say, and usually when I'm writing to members of parliament, I point out how with South African apartheid, we were a leader. We were the first of the G7 countries to put sanctions on South Africa. And even at the Commonwealth meetings, Britain, was against san sanctions, Thatcher was against sanctions, and African countries from the Commonwealth were turning to Canada, and Ronald Reagan was against sanctions, and, and Canada in those days, we stood up against apartheid, and I would love to see us return to the days when human rights matter for everyone, uh, and, you know, and I'm not, you know, I, I believe that Israel has a right to live in peace and security, sure. Um, but the way Palestinians are treated uh, is not within international law and it's not conducive to any sort of a solution. So I, I would like to see us human rights and international law and, and apply it equally to both sides. I'm just gonna pick up a little bit on what Bill said and I'll get to you. Basically, Canada was not credible when I was there in 2013. It was less credible when I was there in 2018. And now I think it's, it's pretty much gone down that, that thing that we use in bathrooms. Um, in terms of gaining any kind of credibility back, my hope resides with, uh, with a lot of you folks in terms of especially newer Canadians as, as I've engaged in this issue more recently over the last couple of months, many of the newer Canadians who I've spoken to when I've asked them why they came, their first answer was because of our beautiful winters. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, one of the things that they've also, they've said is it's not, so much about the economy, although it's better than in many areas, but it's also about Canada's history in terms of believing in human rights and in supporting a just peace. Um, just a, a, a quick story from my own history. 
my dad was in World War II, and he was stationed in Newfoundland, and he was issued a sidearm. Um, he was a sergeant, and so he had a pistol. The one thing I heard him really complain about uh, during the war, aside from being stationed in Newfoundland, uh, England was a much better stationing for him, was with that pistol, he was issued wooden bullets, which are banned under the Fourth Geneva Convention. For somebody in that generation, in the 1940s, who had that level of knowledge in terms of what is just and what is not, what is legal in wartime and what is not, um, that was pretty impressive. And left in, it's left its impression on me. I don't think, I always say to people, I do not think that the situation in Israel and Palestine is overly complicated if you follow international law. It's not. But as soon as you get into the layers and layers and layers, it becomes incredibly difficult to understand and to fathom the degree of violence that exists there against Palestinians. Thank you. I don't have a comment. Um, it's working? Great. Yeah. I don't really have a comment. I was late to arrive, so I'm not sure if we acknowledge the land we're on, oh. but we are on the unceded ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people in Signict, the drainage bin. And um, there's a lot of really interesting reasons why Canada is acting differently with Palestine than it did in South Africa. And one of them is because we now as settlers have consciousness towards our own occupation and involvement in settler complicity in the occupation of indigenous sovereignty here as well. So one of the things we can do is acknowledge our own complicity in settler colonialism as settlers here and connect that um, our, our actions here to the cause of Palestine. And the other thing we can do is also recognize um, the political economy is global. And so our economic actions will have more emphasis than our political ones. So boycotting whatever um, companies support the Israeli apartheid is a really big effective one that has shown um, evidence in being very effective in undermining the war and um, prison, sorry, the military industrial complex. Uh, we, um, totally not affiliated to this group, are meeting at 11 p.m. at Scotiabank on Main Street because tomorrow is a worldwide strike called on by the Palestinian people. So we are going to meet at Scotiabank at 11 p.m. on Main Street to protest Scotiabank's involvement in the war machine in Israel and at 5 p.m. at Indigo Chapters, who also funds the um, IDF and the occupation and apartheid. So you're welcome to join us and also uh, reach out to us to find out how you can economically take action. And I think you meant 11 a.m. Yeah, 11 p.m., <laughs> okay. you're not gonna get much of a crowd. <laughs> Unless and it's the crowd leaving the bar. Yeah, and th thank you for bringing up the, the oversight uh, regarding the uh, land acknowledgement. And I want to say, when, when we first started out, uh, the first few days on the ground in Jerusalem, we all talk a little bit about where we're from and we draw maps and so forth. And I made a point of saying that I was from Mi'kmaq. And, uh, and I said, for those who are not aware, it's also known as Nova Scotia. But, uh, and, uh, and actually, I, I also wanted to mention that when I was at the checkpoint, checkpoint 300, and people practicing their English and that I'm from Nova Scotia, and some would say, well, I hear you're having a lot of forest fires there right now. Yeah, at the time, at the time we were, that they were paying attention to what was going on elsewhere. But um, anyway, thank you for bringing that up. I should have uh, picked up on that at the start, and I didn't. So I've been here since 2019. I'm originally from Egypt, so I know what occupation. <laughs> mm. Um, I'm so thrilled today because it's not just Arabs. I felt that this meeting will be uh, just with Arabs, but this is good that a Canadian born here is now speaking, so I'm so happy that you s feel the truth about what's going on in Gaza and the occupation of Palestine. Yeah. I'm really, really happy. Really, I'm, you know, I'm, I was like crying in tears because you described what 
I know <laughs> right. about because they are our neighbors, so that's why it's more even sensitive for me, especially. Yeah. Um, just one last question I want to ask you. So why I feel that there is silence across? So the normal Canadians that I know in, at work, in the street, nobody speak up about this uh, occupation, what's happening in Gaza. Why is there, is, is it like ignorance, they don't know, or they are on purpose, doesn't want to know or hear about it? Why is that so? Good question. Um, I think some of it has to do with the mainstream media coverage that we get. And I know when I presented at the Maritime Muslim Academy, one of the questions I was asked is, where can I go to get more balanced coverage? Because what I'm seeing in the news isn't really what's happening. And uh, so I said, well, I'll send some links to your principal later that there are other organizations, 972, um, uh, I think Haratz does a better job, The Guardian. There's a number of organizations, news outlets that do a better job than much of what Canada does. And I think that's unfortunate. Um, I think a lot of people are afraid that there's a definition of anti-Semitism that if you criticize Israel, you're anti-Semitic and nobody wants to be called anti-Semitic. So I think that's a part of it personally. There are other definitions that don't, you can criticize Israel without being anti-Semitic, that there is a difference. And I personally think it's, it's mental laziness if you want to cry anti-Semitism uh, at criticizing Israel. Like, let's talk about what's actually happening. Let's, let's talk about the issues. And uh, actually, when you, you mentioned where, where you're from uh, and the, the Arabic lessons I took before going over were classical Arabic. Uh, my instructor was from Egypt. Uh, also want to point out my dad was also a, a veteran of World War II. And at the end of his career, he was in Gaza, 1966, 67. So uh, I was pretty small back then, but uh, so I've had, I've had some familiarity with the, the area, although I really didn't know what was going on. I just thought the pyramids were really cool when he went there, but anyway, uh, glad you're here. Go ahead. I, thank you so much for your talk. It was so informative. I, I just had a question and to actually to your point about the anti-Semitism, um, how would you suggest, because you said, it sounds like what you were saying is that our takeaway is that we need to be the voice for the Palestinians um, and that's what they're asking. And how do you, like, what advice do you have for someone who wants to spread awareness but also wants to keep their day job or wants to, um, you know, and not be kind of canceled? Like, how do you tread that, that line? Yeah, Tre treading the line and not being called anti-Semitic. Uh, it's I guess looking closely at the different definitions and being prepared with the definition that doesn't conflate the two uh, with criticism of Israel, with anti-Semitism. I appreciate that some people, especially if you're in the public service, um, that can be very problematic if, uh, if you're speaking up on any side and certainly during my time in the military, I did not have a public opinion on anything. <laughs> that uh, I, that now that I'm retired, I can actually say what I think. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's tough. And, and I think if you can show some respect for the other side, that what you're concerned about is not Judaism or Jewish people, but it's Israeli government policy and their treatment of minorities uh, and Palestinians in general and, and what amounts to essentially a genocide. Um, but that can be a, you have to, you have to watch your words and, and make sure it doesn't get twisted around on you. But uh, yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's a matter of educating others and being very, very careful in terms of always talking about Israel, period, and international law. And if you stand on the side of international law in terms of its definitions, in terms of what's going on in Gaza right now, as well as if you look at apartheid, it is, it is codified under international law. And that is why groups like Amnesty International, as well as Human Rights Watch, as well as the leading organization in um, Israel, Beth Salem, have all declared Israel to be an apartheid state because they have lawyers who have researched it and argued it. I said that <coughs> when I came back to Canada in 2018. I said it to parliamentarians. I said it to um, officials in Tel Aviv and, and Ramallah. But the reality is many of you are in vulnerable positions. And so one of the key things for us to do is also to educate around uh, what anti-Semitism is and isn't. And there are a couple of people in Halifax who've been doing really good work on that, uh, Larry and Judy Haven. Right, independent and, Jewish voices. And Dali, we're gonna let you have the last question. I'm gonna go out and move the coffee and teapot over. There are some people who have bought, brought some refreshments and Audrey is going to say a couple of words in closing. My final comment is, um, Today is also International Human Rights Day. That's why we chose to have it today. And many of you who are here would know the name John Peters Humphreys, who was really the key drafter of the International Declaration, who is a New Brunswicker. From Hampton, that's right. And there's a statue of him in Hampton. There is indeed. And we all need to learn more about him. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, it's very really appreciated. I have a question is, uh, when we, uh, as a non-Jews, uh, start to talking about what's happening and criticize uh, Israel, we treat it as uh, anti-Semitic. But uh, when the Jewish people, like in a lot of part in the world, start talking and do the same thing and protest, what they call them? Do you have, like, have an idea? When, when the Jewish people are protesting, yes. pro, doing pro-Israel protests. Against, against Israel. Uh, yeah. Oh, Jewish people protesting against Israel. Yeah, yeah they, they still call them, uh, I know that independent Jewish voices that, that was just mentioned, uh, Larry Haven, uh, I, have I have heard their, their organization referred to as anti-Semitic. And I think that's where you just have to yeah, you just don't have an argument. I mean, these are these are Jewish people who are saying, "Not in my name." You don't, and um, and when people don't have a proper thought-out answer, then they'll just go to that. Well, you're anti-Semitic, um, but it's 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 sad. But yeah. Um, I, I, I don't have anything else on that, I guess. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> I seem to be doing this a lot today. Mm. Um, uh, when I was in Israel in 2006, a very wise man said to me when uh, someone called me anti-Semitic is to reply with, no, I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm pro-justice. Mm -hmm. It worked pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks so much, Bill, for coming. We're really, really happy that you were here and that things fit together. I have a little thank you card for you. And I just want you to know that I've made a donation to the MS Fund for ecumenical companies in your honor. Okay. And to thank you for being here. So thanks. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. So I guess the coffee is coming here, or are we going I, to the I think it's that way. So if you head at that door, you, you follow the smell. <laughs> yeah.